to move on to the next segment of today's program, the Meet the Experts, may I call upon Dr. Indika Bodeju and Dr. Tushari Vanigaragna to chair and conduct the sessions. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Indika Bhatheju, specialist in uh, uh, internal medicine, and my co-moderator is uh, Professor Manoj Patirage, uh, senior lecturer and uh, specialist in internal medicine. And today we are going to uh, have the seg this segment, Meet the Expert in Simcon 2023. And we have an expert panel uh, for discuss discussion on maternal medicine, uh, especially dengue in pregnancy. Uh, may I cordially invite uh, Dr. Priyanka Jayawardana and Dr. Anand Jayavikrama to uh, come to the stage, please. And uh, I invite Prof. Manoji Patirage to introduce the, our panel. Thank you, Indika. Good morning, everybody. So uh, today we are going to discuss about uh, uh, two cases of pregnant mothers with dengue hemorrhagic fever. So it's my uh, privilege to introduce our esteemed panel, uh, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, uh, consultant physician, National Institute of Infectious Disease, and he's the newly appointed NMRA uh, chairman. And our other, uh, second speaker is Dr. Priyanka Rajavadana, uh, specialist physician in internal medicine who has specialized, uh, special interest in maternal medicine and who served uh, Castle Hospital and DMH for many more years. Thank you, Indika. Thank you, Manoji. So we'll uh, start the uh, discussion. Mm. Can we have the slides, please? Yes, uh, in this segment of uh, clinical discussion with experts, uh, we discuss uh, first uh, dengue in a pregnant woman with a mechanical heart valve. So the, she is Mrs. MAHP, uh, she's a 22-year-old female we, in her first pregnancy, presented in period of gestation 35 weeks, admitted uh, due to reduced fetal movements five days ago to the hospital. And she was referred to us due to high fever she had uh, on the very first day, uh, five days after the admission. And the fever was associated with headache, myalgia, and loose toes, but she did not have cough, dysuria, abdominal pain, or chest pain. And she was complaining of short, shortness of breath on exertion without chest palpitations, uh, chest pain, or orthopnea. And her past medical history was uh, remarkable. Uh, she has undergone mitral valve replacement in 2014 and she was on warfarin 7.5 milligram daily. Uh, she had no history of bleeding. And uh, she had history of two episodes of cerebral ischemic events. Uh, in 2017, she has had a right-sided weakness due to lacuna infarction from which she has been uh, recovered. And 2018, she had a TIA. And there was no history of well thrombosis or endocarditis in the past. And uh, her APLS screen was negative. Uh, and she gave a history of acute glomerulonephritis nephritis in 2016. However, the recent uh, renal function tests were normal. On examination, uh, she was 60 kilos, febrile, flushed, and she, had, she was mildly pale, and blood pressure was 90 by 60, heart rate was 70, it was regular, uh, not in AF. Uh, she had a pansystolic murmur uh, with a mechanical first heart sound, and the lungs were clear, and abdomen was soft, uh, with the compatible with gravid uterus for 35 weeks of period of gestation. So the differential diagnosis we considered while we were waiting for the investigations were viral fever, including dengue, influenza, and COVID-19, whether it's a UTI, uh, asymptomatic UTI, no so common infection, no lung infection. Uh, septicemia, especially in the percent of mechanical uh, heart valve, and chorioamnitis and connective tissue disorders. While we were waiting for the investigations, uh, we make sure that we hydrate her well, 100 ml power, oral fluids, and we monitored her urine output and other vital parameters. And uh, we confirmed the antibiotic availability in case we have to give, and we maintain the IV access for her. So we received the investigations. Uh, she, had, uh, she had anemia, HB of 7.6, with a low hematocrit value, and MCV is low, 
and uh, cell distribution which was high. Uh, and Y cell count was uh, normal and the platelets were normal. So her full blood count was suggestive of uh, iron deficiency anemia. Um, the CRP was not that high, 20.3, and the UFR showed past cells 10 to 15, otherwise normal. And her dengue NS1 antigen was positive. Her INR, however, it was 1.78, which was subtherapeutic in the presence of mechanical mitral valve. So in summary, uh, we had the dengue infection during pregnancy at 35 weeks of POA, presented with uh, dengue febrile phase from day one. And she was on anticoagulation with warfarin uh, I, uh, on, for mechanical mitral valve. The INR was subtherapeutic. And she has had iron deficiency anemia, having HB of 7.6. And she was anemic from the very first day of the infection. So uh, we had a few questions for this patient uh, when we were managing. Uh, whether we have to increase warfarin or stop warfarin, uh, especially in the background of where she has had uh, two episodes of ischemic events, uh, cerebral events, and uh, whether to start on subcutaneous enoxaparin or start IV heparin, and whether she needs IV blood transfusion at this stage in the very first day uh, uh, in the febrile phase, or can we deliver the baby at a period of gestation of 35 weeks uh, in an early febrile phase at day one or day two. Um, so these were the clinical uh, problems we had and we would like to get expert opinion about the management, uh, the any guideline or the further management uh, for this patient at this point. What should we have done? Good morning. Thank you, Indika. Uh, <coughs> we know dengue in pregnancy itself is a complicated uh, scenario with increased morbidity and mortality. However, in this case, in addition to dengue in pregnancy, the pregnant mother is having a mechanical valve replacement and it's on warfarin. And in addition, she had history of uh, uh, thrombotic uh, events in the past. Um, uh, so about the, uh, on answering these questions, uh, we have very limited evidence, if at all. So therefore, we have to base our decisions on the on uh, case by case uh, basis, with the uh, possible logical explanation for decisions. Uh, since uh, we know that since the bearding is a, itself is a disease which can cause bleeding, uh, this patient is prone to develop bleeding uh, with the with the. Uh, during the course of the illness. So therefore, it's better to uh, stop warfarin and uh, change to uh, enoxaparin or heparin, uh, giving enoxaparin is it be easier. Uh, and uh, because uh, when necessary, we can stop it. Uh, when the count, blood counts are going down, when she's more likely to develop bleeding, is uh, we can stop uh, anticoagulation. And uh, since her hemoglobin is low, 7.6, anyway, it is low, and also we know she is likely to, she might bleed, and especially if she goes into labor. So I would give her a blood transfusion uh, at this time itself. And then uh, about the delivery, uh, if there's no immediate threat to the mother's life, uh, I would wait for uh, until the dengue is over. Uh, before going for a cesarean section or inducing the labor uh, because uh, it's still 35 weeks and we know the illness will go on for, uh, for a week, the, the dengue illness. Thank you, Ananda. I agree with you. And anyway, warfarin in pregnancy, first trimester we don't give it warfarin. And the last six weeks before delivery also we don't give warfarin. So there's no question we could stop the warfarin in this patient. And... Uh, IV heparin and the warfarin, the advantage in clinical practice, you can monitor the activity. Uh, but enoxaparin is easy, though you can't uh, monitor the activity, that enoxaparin is easy to give, so I would prefer enoxaparin in this patient. If the patient is going on for labels, uh, then I would, with good platelet count, then I would consider heparin, because we can, if we, once we stop the heparin, within one or two hours, uh, uh, action of heparin is over, or we can give protamine and, and immediately revert the action of uh, heparin. So in this patient, as we are uh, planning to uh, uh, go on with the pregnancy, we, I would consider enoxaparin and heparin. 
Yes, blood transfusion, any way HB 7.5 is not safe in uh, pregnancy just before delivery. Uh, forget about the dengue, forget about the mechanical well, they have to have a good hemoglobin at the time of the delivery. We have to give uh, blood transfusion. On top of that, this patient is uh, having dengue and it's, uh, they have tendency to bleed and at term we have to transfuse blood and keep some blood for emergency. Uh, if this patient comes around 38 weeks, I would consider a uh, section at this point, but 35 is too early and the lungs are not mature, so I don't think justifiable to do a section at this stage. So we continue the pregnancy. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, actually we stopped warfarin and started on subcutaneous insuparin, 60 milligram twice a day, and uh, one unit of blood transfuse, 125 milliliters per hour during the febrile phase. And the uh, other fluid management and monitoring were done according to the dengue uh, guidelines. And we did the uh, MDT meeting as well as the cardiac assessment. For the MDT meeting, uh, at this point, we had the physician, cardiologist, uh, VOG, and the anesthetist and hematologist. And uh, following the MDT meeting, uh, we did the echocardiogram, which showed uh, intact mitral valve with mild mitral regurgitation. And uh, there was no mild trom uh, well thrombosis or endocarditis. It was not evident. And the regional wall motion abnormalities were not there, and the ejection question was good. So this was the uh, fever chart, uh, and we showed that she was uh, recovering from febrile phase, but unfortunately, she had evidence of entering to the critical phase in day five. Uh, and uh, her platelet count was on day five, uh, went down less than 100,000. And then uh, we had few curries at that point uh, uh, because the ultrasound also showed mild degree of leaking with uh, fluid in the hepatorenal pouch and the pericolcystic fluids as well as right-sided mild proliferation. So at this point, now she has uh, entered the critical phase uh, uh, in the first few hours. Can we continue anticoagulation during critical phase of dengue in the presence of low platelets, which is less than 100,000? And do we have to convert subcut enoxaparin to IV heparin uh, during this critical phase where she can have bleeding later on? And when and how to decide on stopping anticoagulation during critical phase? Is there any guideline? Uh, what clinical, feature, clinical signs or features to fo follow? And is there any indication for prophylactic antibiotics uh, in this patient, especially in the presence of endocarditis, uh, uh, mechanical mitral valve to prevent endocarditis? And uh, her visceral counts seems to be dropping uh, more than usual uh, to less than 10,000. Uh, so these were the clinical queries we had uh, when managing this patient. Uh, now the patient has started to leak. Uh, so we know it's a, it's a bleeding uh, tendency is there. Uh, however, even without that, when the platelet counts are going down, uh, the chances of bleeding is high in dengue. So therefore, when the, uh, but of course we, have very, we, have, we don't have any evidence as such, but in this situation, what I would suggest is to stop uh, enoxaparin when the platelet count goes below 150,000, even if, the, if there is no leaking. If there is leaking, definitely, yes, we have to stop uh, anticoagulation anyway. Uh, and also we have to remember that the, in pregnant, uh, pregnancy, patients can leak earlier than non-pregnant people, so we have to anticipate leaking when the platelet count goes below 150,000. Well, Ananda, if you ask from the hematology colleagues, they might ask us to wait for a little bit, you know, the platelet count. Some people are, you know, confident even with platelet count 30,000, 40,000, they will say that you can wait until 50,000. But when it comes to the dengue, it's a dif uh, different kind of a medical uh, problem and uh, uh, we should uh, stop the anticoagulation, but uh, we have to discuss the... At, we, what platelet count, maybe the 50,000 or 100,000 or 150,000, so it should be a, a team decision. And uh, uh, there's no difference between the enoxaparin and heparin. Uh, you know, if the platelet count is going down, both, we have to stop both, uh, either enoxaparin or heparin. And when you uh, uh, 
uh, stop the anticoagulation at critical phase, you don't, the leaking, uh, there's no relationship between the fluid leakage and the stopping the anticoagulants. Basically, it's the platelet count. And you can also consider when you stop those things, the hemoglobin level and the PCV and hematocrit, uh, you know, that uh, uh, there's a tendency to bleed. And at what stage you, uh, you are going to stop the anticoagulant? And in pregnancy and uh, in dengue, uh, you have to take the uh, liver enzymes also to the account and maybe the coagulation when, uh, uh, when you st think about stopping the anticoagulants, but basically it's the platelet count. And uh, prophylaxic antibiotics, uh, dengue, uh, sorry, pregnancy and mechanical, well, if you uh, go to the literature, different, different guidelines says different things. And uh, uh, though somebody is pregnant and having a mechanical uh, cardiac well, that that, that is not an indication to give prophylactic endocarditis, but no harm giving it. Uh, uh, because just because somebody is having uh, low platelet count, low white cell count, and mechanical uh, uh, cardiac well, again, that combination also, uh, not a straightforward indication to give uh, prophylactic uh, uh, endocarditis antibiotic, but still you can give in clinical setup. But this patient has uh, uh, prosthetic cardiac wells, pregnancy, and delivery and low platelet count and you know a bit of complication situation that kind of scenario i would consider uh, endocarditis prophylaxis then we have to discuss the what kind of antibiotic we should start so i think she's for uh, antibiotics to prevent endocarditis yes okay thank you very much and uh, so after day five uh, uh, day, ten, uh, day seven, uh, she was recovering and uh, uh, platelet count was rising. And uh, we started uh, the subcut and exoparin once the platelet count is more than 100,000. And we stopped uh, subcut and exoparin 24 hours prior to delivery, where sh she had uh, labor pains and fetal distress after two days from after coming out from the critical phase. And uh, we started subcut and exoparin, uh, restarted uh, after the delivery with warfarin and uh, once the INR was more than two, we discontinued the enoxaparin. And uh, we have given IV piperacillin uh, tazobactam uh, uh, since fr uh, from the third day of uh, her fever because the white cell count was going down. And at the time of uh, start, it was uh, the platelet, white cell count was less than 1.5 and the ne absolute neutral count, neutrophil count was uh, less than 500. So it was following the MDT meeting, and uh, uh, then she had uh, delivered the baby at 36 weeks, and uh, that is three days after the clinical recovery, and uh, it was done under epidural anesthesia, and indication was fetal distress, and she delivered a healthy baby. So thank you very much for that uh, uh, expert opinion. And now I would like to hand over uh, uh, to Dr. Ma Professor Manoji for the next case. Thank you, Indika. Okay, so we are going to discuss about the second case. Uh, let me present the case. Okay, this is about a 31-year-old lady in her first pregnancy who comes to the hospital with a POA of 34 weeks with a twin pregnancy, which is complicated with a placenta previa covering the entire os, and uh, she admitted to the hospital with fever for two days. She has high-grade fever with backache and headache. There were no features of upper respiratory tract infection or urinary tract infection. There was no history of bleeding as well. Her NS1 antigen became positive on the day two uh, with a white cell count of 14,000, hemoglobin of 11, hematocrit of 34, and platelet count of 206. She was uh, clinically stable till the day four of the illness and developed thrombocytopenia of 72 with a white cell count of 6.4 and hemoglobin of 10.3 with a hematocrit of 29 at day four. Ultrasound reveals that she has got evidence of dengue leaking, so therefore she was started on the critical phase uh, monitoring chart. So this is a summary of her day four illness, which shows that she's having gallbladder wall edema with a platelet count of 72, which was begin with 206. 
uh, and hematocrit of uh, 34, which has in increased from the baseline of 29 as well. So at this point, I would ask three questions from our panel. So what will be the approach at this point? Is it the routine dengue hemorrhagic fever care? Um, and as you said, uh, Dr. Anand Vijayvakram, uh, because you said that in pregnancy, the leaking can start even uh, well before the platelet count becomes hundreds. So I would like to ask about these questions. Uh, yes. Uh, so by the time the patient uh, was detected as having leaking, the platelet count of 72,000. So very likely the leaking would have, by that time, by the time it was detected, patient would have gone into the critical phase for about maybe 15, 18 hours. Uh, generally, we expect uh, the leaking to start when the platelet count goes below 100,000 in non-pregnant uh, people. Uh, but here they start, as I said earlier, they start leaking early. So usually uh, when the count is around 125, 130, uh, they start leaking. Uh, so by the time leaking is detected, it would have maybe 15, 18 hours into the leaking phase. Uh, and uh, the routine care will be same as for other non-pregnant uh, patients. Uh, when the leaking is detected, we know the patient is leaking, so we have to increase the amount of fluid given. Uh, not the maintenance fluid, you have to increase the maintenance fluid because in addition to the maintenance, there is plasma leakage. Therefore, even if the patient is stable, otherwise increase the amount of fluid. Um, other special concern here is the placenta previa. If the patient goes in to develop, uh, start uh, labor pains, uh, goes into labor, it can be a big problem. Therefore, you have to anticipate problems in here and get ready with blood to give if necessary in case if we can go for a uh, go for an uh, emergency section to save mother's life. Anandji, I think uh, this, looking at the case, this uh, medical problem that, you know, the dengue and the twin pregnancy, twin pregnancy itself carries a high risk for high blood pressure and possible uh, preeclampsia. And the placenta previa, high risk for uh, uh, detachment, the abrupt placenta and with this, uh, with high blood pressure and maybe possible thrombocytopenia. So we have to prepare for the medical management and we have to be, uh, we have to have a very strong MDT team uh, to manage the obstetric problem. As Ananda said, we go ahead with the link management and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so um, at the 36 hours of the Ill, uh, leaking, uh, patient developed tachypnea, desaturation, and tachycardia while maintaining a good urine output, and she was given a fluid at a flat rate. Uh, so the respiratory rate was 40, saturation was 92 on air, heart rate was 140 per minute, and blood pressure was 140 by 90, which is little higher than the normal. And her platelet count dropped into 16, and the hematocrit remains in 34 with a near normal hemoglobin level. SGPTOT shows mi mild in increase and the echocardiogram was normal with a preserved ejection fraction and the blood gas analysis shows that pH of 7.3 with a bicarb of 15 and lactate level of 10. So now the patient has become unstable and the reason we, the common reasons we see in dengue patients when they become unstable are either they are bleeding or uh, they are hypovolemic. Now here the hematocrit has gone up from 29, 29 to 34.5, so the, we know the patient is uh, leaking. Uh, and also uh, the ABG shows that uh, the lactate of 10 and patient is becoming acidotic. Now this is indicative of hypovolemia. And the fact that the patient was given fluid at a rat flat rate con contributes to this. Uh, if the leaking is significant. So this is uh, the likely reason. Since the patient is towards the latter part of the critical phase, now we have to give more fluid to correct hypovolemia, but since the patient is in latter part of the critical phase, uh, the choice of fluid will be uh, dextran here. Uh, and at the same time, we have to anticipate bleeding in this patient. Therefore, once the dextran is given, you have to check the hematocrit after that, and the, if the hematocrit drop, PCV drop is significant, more than expected, uh, then we have to or give uh, transfused blood as well. 
Manoji, you mentioned the term that in spite of good urine output, uh, in pregnancy when you manage dengue patient, we have to be very careful about the urine output because you know we have to have an idea about the physiological change of the changes in the pregnancy and how it affects the dengue management. For example, uh, the, during the pregnancy there is accumulation of fluid and the hemodilution and the accumulation of fluid could be nearly 50%, though HB and PCV could drop during the pregnancy. And the, in the advance of pregnancy, the peripheral, there is a peripheral vasodilatation, so diastolic blood pressure lowers, and how they maintain the blood pressure with increasing the heart rate. So the, the, some kind of tachycardia is normal in pregnancy. And the, because of the lowering of the diastolic blood pressure, the pulse pressure is widened. In normal dengue patient, when the pulse pressure is less than 20, we think that the patient is going for shock. But in pregnancy, because of the physiological changes, the, if the pulse pressure is more than, uh, uh, more than 30, then we have to think about uh, uh, patient is going for shock. Another thing, the gravid uterus partly occupies the part of the lung in the residual pulmonary capacity is reduced, the respiratory could go up a little bit during the pregnancy. And the more importantly, and the during the pregnancy, renal blood flow is high and the GFR is high. So in, spi in spite of shock, and the patient could have a uh, very good urine output because of the uh, high GFR and uh, good renal uh, uh, blood flow. So when we manage uh, 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 pregnant uh, mother with dengue, urine output could be, uh, urine output could be misleading, but it is an important parameter though. Yes. So as you suggested, so uh, it is a good lesson that we should not only look at the urine output. And uh, I, we have noted that her blood pressure was little elevated than normal. So whether this, this is alarming in something else, because after completing of the 48 hours, her tachypnea and tachycardia settled as suggested that we have given dextran and she was uh, shown an improvement. But despite that, her blood pressure remains high and her old reflexes become exaggerated with a urine albumin of three pluses. Platelet remained low and the transaminases went high and at that time blood picture was normal, only uh, features of viral infection was there and in the repeat ultrasound it shows trace amount of ascites with a stable obstetric scan. So uh, the next question is, is it extended dengue leaking or is she developing any complications of pregnancy like preeclampsic toxemia with severe features? And what is the place for delivery with a platelet count of nine at the moment with a placenta previa? And indications for steroids uh, in the obstetric uh, point of view? Usually the critical phase lasts for 48 hours, however in complicated cases it can extend beyond that. Uh, but in this case, as shown by the ultrasound examination, the fluid has been reabsorbed. So the critical phase is already over. Uh, but the patient is now having issues and the, the main reason is, seems to be the patient is getting preeclampsia, the reflexes are exaggerated and the blood pressure is going up. So it is uh, important that now uh, the dengue part is becoming uh, uh, getting over, however, still the patient platelet count is low and the patient is in the, in the, uh, towards the convalescent part of dengue. Uh, so now we have to think seriously of managing the preeclampsia and uh, with the, uh, of course, still since the, even though critical phase is over, still the, the risk of bleeding is there, therefore we have to uh, delay the labor as much as possible. However, considering the uh, PET, and the placenta uh, previa, we have to uh, decide, discuss with the ob obstetric uh, uh, experts and decide how much we can delay the labor. And, uh, but when it becomes a threat to the mother's life in th this situation, we have to have a cesarean section and deliver the baby. Uh, about the steroids, if the, the pediatricians think is th if the lung is still immature, then we, we can give steroids, but not IM. Uh, it should be IV. <laughs> this is again a common, bit of common scenario for a physician. A pregnant mother with elevated liver enzymes, low platelet, could be dengue. In dengue, we postpone the delivery. And elevated liver enzyme, low platelet, it could be help. 
and preeclampsia. In preeclampsia, we expedite the delivery. So we, the physicians and the obstetrician decision whether to postpone the delivery, thinking about the, the dengue scenario, or whether to expedite the delivery, thinking about the eclampsia. So then you have to consider other things that dengue, that this one is definitely dengue, we have a dengue uh, scenario, and we, then you get the other features like eclamptic features, the liver enzyme you can get, it. the SGOT is high in uh, dengue, SGPT, SGOT both equal in eclampsia. Check the urine albumin, albumin is positive, and check the blood pressure, blood pressure is high. Check the reflexes, reflexes are exaggerated. You can call the hematologist and ask the blood picture, and if the blood picture says microangiopathic hemolytic anemia-like picture, then that that is more favor of eclampsia. In that kind of scenario, I think we should move forward uh, to delivery, keep in the mind that low HB, low plate, and coagulopathy, and the uh, other parameters. Okay. So as you suggested that her headache and symptoms were persisted, blood pressure was high, reflexes were exaggerated, and she was irritable, and there was platelet further dropped into six, and worsening of transaminases urine albumin 3 pluses and blood picture reveals microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So the diagnosis confirmed that now she's having, despite of dengue, she's having preeclampsic toxemia. So now we have to manage her hypertension and the place for magnesium sulfate till we prepare her for the delivery because the platelet is six. We have to do a lot more to more for the delivery and she needs the section as well as she's having twin pregnancy with a placenta previa. So then how are we going to stabilize her for the section as well? Well, I think we should plan for immediate delivery uh, and uh, think about the, the hemoglobin, platelet and uh, coagulopathy and the blood pressure and the saturation and oral parameters. And I would uh, correct the hemoglobin by giving more blood because there's a, the HB is still low and there's a possibility of bleeding and the coagulopathy. I would consider giving platelets because this is not the uh, uh, dengue management. This is dengue plus and dengue surgery and surgeon is going to use a scalpel at this point. So correct the platelet. And uh, that we have given lots of fluid and if you are giving fluid, I would consider FFP because it helped the coagulopathy. And when it comes to the antihypertensives, you can use uh, labidolol, nifedipine, methyl dopa, whatever you prefer. And magnesium sulfate, yes, I would consider it, giving a bolus and in, uh, uh, continuous infusion. Max sulfate, uh, reduce the blood pressure and prevent eclampsia and stabilize the patient with blood and plasma and platelet and blood pressure control and Duration, okay, as per the discussion that we went, uh, went with the emergency section after transfusing six units of platelet while at the theater bed and ICU care was arranged for the post-op care and prothrombin complex concentrated, uh, concentrate was kept ready for an emergency use and intraoperative blood loss were replaced with blood rather than any other uh, colloids or crystalloids. Two live babies were delivered and they were sent to the neonatal ICU. Amniotic fluid was little blood stain and shows the partial placental separation. Patient transferred to the ICU for further care. So as you said that we have given FFP and blood for the rest of the 24 hours management uh, because uh, patient's coagulation was little altered, INR was 1.8 platelet was 6 and after the transfusion it was 20 and uh, luckily there were no major bleeding. Uh, so uh, because of this overloaded problems, we consider about a little bit of frusamide during the transfusions of the FFP continuously. Uh, so anything else that uh, we need to uh, think about in these two scenarios? I think um, I think you have done well in this uh, case, uh, and uh, as you did the, in this one, when you consider surgery, you have to give platelet just before the surgery, uh, because the platelet lifespan is very limited. Platelet get destroyed very rapidly in this situation, so therefore give it just just before uh, taking the patient to the theatre or, or even at the theatre table, and then during the surgery we advise them to give blood uh, because they tend to bleed. So therefore, giving blood, you have to convince the anesthetist and the obstetrician that the patient needs blood uh, so, and give blood during the surgery because they, they uh, lose blood. And after that, if the INR is uh, prolonged, then giving FFP 
uh, instead of the normal fluid uh, which is useful to correct the clotting. Okay, thank you, sir. So the take home messages are there. So if the surgery is indicated, obstetric point of view, we have to go ahead with that. Uh, early leaking, you have to anticipate despite the platelet count. Always think, think about the obstetric complications combined with the dengue and give the priority depends on the situation. Always better to have MDT meetings and expert opinion to get the decisions. So the proper documentation is also really necessary. So at the end of this, I would like to conclude the discussion about the maternal medicine uh, with dengue fever. So I would like to invite Dr. Indika Bhatheju to hand over the token of appreciation uh, to our panelist, Dr. Ananda Vijayavikrama and Dr. Priyanka Rajasi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the second part of the Meet the Experts session. I'm Dr. Tushari Manigaratna, consultant in internal medicine. Our expert panel comprises of Professor Indika Gavaramana, Professor in Medicine, and Dr. Madhuvanti Hetiarache, consultant in internal medicine attached to the toxicology unit, Peradenia. So we will be presenting a case, um, not much discussed, approach to a patient with unknown poisoning. So toxicology is a little bit different. You don't have accepted guidelines. So I will be presenting my case, and in between, I, our expert panel will help in managing the complex problems. Uh, so let me start with my patient. He's a 34-year-old male, transferred patient from a peripheral hospital to toxicology unit Peradenia. Patient is moderately dehydrated. GCS is 10 out of 15, with pupils 3 millimeters bilaterally reactive. He had low blood pressure. His pulse volume was low with bradycardia. He is tachypneic with bilateral lung crepes, and his saturation is 80% on room air. So he's a known patient with drug abuse and alcohol abuse. He, he did not have any previous illnesses. There was a query of self-ingestion of multiple tablets. He delayed presentation to the tertiary center. So let me start with uh, Dr. Indika. What is your approach to this patient and how are you going to manage this patient? Um, thanks, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, as this, is, this is one of the worst uh, cases you'll ever see. I mean, whether it, be gen whether it, whether it be toxicology or any other illness, this is an emergency. You've got three, three problems here, low GCS, hypotension um, uh, and uh, wet lungs um, and so and hypoxic. So this is these three things in combination makes your patient uh, a very sick patient. And in, in case of uh, poisoning, when a patient presents with low GCS and hypotension, your mortality rate actually doubles, almost doubles, especially in cases of uh, OP po uh, agrochemical poisoning. The case rate, case fatality rate doubles if your GCS is low. And um, this patient, as you, as you mentioned, is, is, is tachypneic, very uh, hypoxic and uh, 
hypoxic with wet lungs and uh, hypotensive. And in your assessment of airway and breathing, you'll have a very low threshold to intubate this patient. You know, suck the secretions quickly, and then uh, you'll have a, you should intubate this patient as early, early as possible. Unlike other conditions in, in poisoning, you know, uh, the trend when when somebody is sick, you know, they go go down down the line. You know, they get sicker and sicker and sicker. So you need early action. You have a very short window of opportunity to get this patient stabilized. So this patient, um, go back, no, don't change the slides. Um, so you would get your nurses, your nurses, your assistant doctors to put two IV lines to this patient uh, and then also uh, arrange a CV, uh, CV line insertion because, you know, this patient's going to need those. And then as an early measure, yeah, you need to look after the blood pressure. So give uh, fluid boluses. That's the key. You can use either crystalloids or colloids. It doesn't matter. Uh, need, what you need to do is fluid push as early as possible. You can give easily without any fear about 20 to 30 mils, of, uh, mils per kg uh, bolus, depending on, the, depending on the blood pressure response. You can go up to about three, uh, three doses, three boluses. And thereafter, you can start an infusion uh, of quite a large infusion, maybe 120 mils per hour, depending on the body weight of the patient. And then uh, assess the disability of the patient. I mean, the neurological disability. Uh, uh, this has dual purposes. One is to assess your uh, requirement for intubation and other measures, but also to, uh, to make a possible diagnosis. Uh, you do a head-to-toe examination with neurology in mind, look at the pupils, look at focal signs, and see if, if you can find out um, the etiology of the, or, or the presentation. Then look at the patient's uh, injuries. Sometimes these, some of these in, uh, episodes are violent. They have environment threats. They may have uh, poisoning over, over their bodies. And also, sometimes they have, they have been under the influence of alcohol. They can, be locked, they can lock themselves up in a room and they can become quite hypothermic. That can complicate matters. So you need to do, attend to all these things uh, at the beginning. And then, once you're given fluids uh, and intubated, you need to look, if the blood pressure does not respond, you need to give, uh, I mean, as you'd agree, give vasopressors. Uh, if you have a, uh, have a bedside ultrasound, you can look at the IVC and see how, feel, how well filled the patient is. And if it is underfilled, you can actually give more fluids. But you need to, you, you have, you, you, you can, um, I choose any inotrope basically that responds. So you could um, use, usually use vasopressors, direct vasopressors, and look at the response. And if you have a bedside echo, you can look at the heart and see whether the problem is one of vasodilatation or a poor con cardiac contractility. And you can target your inotropes based on that, uh, either to increase the inotropy or to, ma to make, uh, to get, give them a vasoconstriction. And since you're not sure how long the patient has been down, uh, you, you, nobody will find fault with you by giving a broad spectrum antibiotic because the patient may have got as, aspirated. And also, in a toxicological scenario, you know, if you have a glucagon, without knowing what the poison is, you could actually, if the patient does not respond, you could actually give a shot of glucagon if you have it. So at this point, uh, what are your differential diagnosis and what is the place of DOC syndrome in this differential diagnosis, Madhuanti? Yes, uh, Tushari. Uh, uh, now, in this uh, case, diagnosis is really challenging uh, due to the unknown nature of the poison and its potential consequences. So you need to have a systematic approach. Uh, we have actually discussed about, you know, how to apply the toxidrome. So this uh, toxidromic approach should be used uh, in this particular instance. Now the key uh, issues here are hypotension, hypoxia, the patient is bradycardic as well as there's a low GCS and tachypnea. So uh, the, the possible diagnosis are uh, it can be an OP poisoning, TCA toxicity, brain stem CVS and sepsis. You know, the patient has been uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, presented very late and he was aspirated also. So there's a possibility of sepsis as well. The ethanol toxicity, toxic alcohol syndrome, and the, with the low blood pressure and everything, you have to anticipate uh, antihypertensive overdose also. 
So what is your next approach to the management? How do you proceed from there now? Now, uh, you know, the investigations are the key uh, to, you know, uh, arrive at a diagnosis at this moment. Now, you need to do a bedside RBS, do an ECG and uh, arterial blood gas, which is a, a, actually uh, will lead uh, so much of information so that you can arrive at a diagnosis. So, uh, I hope that you have uh, sort of, you know, uh, arranged these investigations. Yes, we have done the basic investigation. You can see the RBS is 245, ECG patient has sinus bradycardia with the heart block, and arterial blood gas suggests uh, metabolic acidosis with pH low, bicarbonate low, with increased lactate. So how do you proceed from there? Yeah, now uh, the thing is now here, uh, you can see that there's a, a evidence of high blood sugar. Now the patient did not have uh, diabetes, so the patient has presented with hyperglycemia, and there's evidence of low blood pressure and bradycardia with first degree heart block, and there's metabolic acidosis. So all uh, favors towards the calcium channel blocker toxicity in this particular patient. So we have calculated the anion gap. Anion gap is around 15, where 8 to 12 would be within the normal range. So how do you explain this high anion gap metabolic acidosis in calcium channel blocks, uh, toxicity? And can we explain the high increase of lactate? Uh, yes, Tushari. Now, metabolic acidosis is quite possible with uh, CCB toxicity uh, because CCB actually interferes with calcium-stimulated mitochondrial action and the glucose catabolism, which will result in uh, lactate production and ATP hydrolysis contributing to acidosis. Now, increased lactate uh, may be explained by several different mechanisms. It can be due to dehydration. CCB toxicity itself can cause uh, increased lactate and the sepsis uh, and hypoxia. Yeah, the patient has had very low blood pressure. And if there's any co-ingestion of any other medication such as metformin, again, the lactate will, will go up. And then starvation also can give rise to increased lactate. So for the investigation, the initial investigation shows uh, he has neutrophil leukocytosis with high sedum creatinine. Uh, CRP is around 7.5. And he has high ASTLT with evidence of pulmonary edema in the chest X-ray and evidence of impaired contractility. So how can you explain this uh, investigation? Because this is very uh, tricky because it's, everything depends on your investigation most of the time to narrow down and come into the further management in the absence of accepted guidelines. So how do you explain these investigations, Madhuvanti? Yeah, high RB is actually due to the blockage of calcium channels in the pancreas and due to the insulin resistance. Now, with high WBC and neutrophil uh, leukocytosis must have been due to sepsis, and evidence of organ dysfunction due to shock would have resulted in uh, increased creatinine and the increase in ASTLT at this moment. And uh, CCP toxicity, of course, causes selective dilatation of the afferent side of the capillary network, and it can cause cardiogenic pulmonary, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And the echocardiography shows impaired contractility due to the uh, inhibition of calcium influx to the cardiac muscles. Once the differential diagnosis are narrowed down, a thorough collateral history and basic lab investigation pave the pathway to exact diagnosis. Uh, when obtaining a collateral history, later on, we have discovered that patient had taken metformin 10 tablets and extended release calcium channel blocker verapamil 10 tablets on the previous day to the uh, admission. And patient has admitted to the tertiary care hospital after 18 hours of toxin ingestion. So, now, what is the place of decontamination? And we have three questions there together. Can we give gastric lavage, mind you, that it is the 18 hour post admission? And what is the place of activated charcoal? And is there a place of whole bubble irrigation? So it's over to you, Indika. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, decontamination um, uh, uh, is an important part of uh, uh, management of a poison patient. But actually, it's important whom not to give. You know, if you, uh, that the practice is based upon uh, mainly theoretical evidence. 
and you take something and then it'll it'll stay in your stomach and you put it you know you can put a tube and remove it but if you if you remember your physiology it, it doesn't last maybe a, a longer than half an hour maybe one hour after you've taken it if you take an anticholinergic poison it might stay uh, in in for a, long, a little longer but usually um, it doesn't it is not there in your stomach after about one hour so we we don't practice gastric lavage after about one maximum two hours uh, so this patient is clearly uh, beyond that time period so it, it, there's no uh, no indication there at all so activated charcoal same principle if you are giving activated charcoal you have to give it very early one hour the best um, some if you are taking a slow relief preparation you can give it for up to maybe two to four hours but this patient is beyond that uh, since this patient has taken a uh, uh, slow release or extended preparation uh, calcium channel blockers uh, these tend to form what are called pharmacobezoas or they make in themselves into a concretion so, and that can remain in your in your gastrointestinal tract, tract for a longer period and therefore we can mechanically push this uh, concretions out by using whole bowel irrigation. So I would, I would give a whole bowel irrigation to this patient uh, since, he's, he's got, since he's got ongoing toxicity and he's taken a long acting uh, uh, verifiable. So what is the place of enhanced animation here? Uh, you go down, yes. Uh, but enhanced elimination, there, there has to be key, key characteristics of a poison to be removed uh, uh, through mainly hemodialysis. But it, has to, it should have a small volume or distribution. It should not be protein, well protein bound. So calcium channel blockers have a very uh, large volume or distribution and they're highly protein bound. So for, for removal of uh, uh, calcium channel blockers itself, well, I will not, uh, it's, it's, it's useless doing that. And other forms of urinary alkalization, alkalization like urinary, sorry, urinary alkalization does not work. There are specific indications for urinary alkalization. Uh, so yes, I will not uh, do this. this so question. antidotes, we talk in toxicology. Yeah. So what Madhuanti thinks regarding the antidote for this patient? Yeah, now we come to the antidote. Now here, the antidote is uh, Hyatt, high insulin euglycemic therapy. Now it improves the circulatory shock in CCB overdose patient. Uh, you have to uh, uh, um, uh, advocate uh, this uh, in the early, uh, uh, cause of the uh, disease because you know it, uh, initially it was thought it was the last ditch measure. Now there's increasing evidence that is it's beneficial to start hired as soon as possible. So you need to commence therapy. Uh, before that, you need to uh, replenish the glucose. And uh, if the uh, the patient is uh, hypoglycemia, having hypoglycemia, then you need to uh, put uh, glucose 25 uh, grams of IV bolus and then start short-acting insulin in uh, one uh, international units per kg uh, to saturate the insulin receptors and then you continue the therapy with short-acting insulin infusion and uh, start at a rate of 0.5 international units per kg per hour and you need to titrate it every 30 minutes uh, to a maximum of 5 international units per kg per hour. Now, make sure that you uh, maintain the uh, euglycemia with dextrose infusion uh, and monitor every 20 minutes of the first one hour and replace uh, the potassium if the potassium level is less than 2.5. And uh, uh, you might ask what are the therapeutic endpoints of height? So if there's any improvement of ejection fraction more than 50% and if there's any increase in the blood pressure and the adequate heart rate is maintained, and uh, resolution of acidemia with euglycemia, and uh, the urine output should be maintained around 1 to 2 ml per kg per hour. And look at the echo, uh, see whether there's any reversal of cardiac abnormalities and improvement of the mentation of the patient. And uh, you make sure that you uh, withdraw the vasopressors first, and then you uh, reduce the rate of the uh, Hyatt. Uh, and uh, dextrose may be required even after you have uh, stopped the insulin. So what is the place of calcium replacement? So patient has had calcium channel blocker and with this uh, FC dosis, uh, the place of sodium bicarbonate uh, and also the bradycardia and pacing, atropin and pacing. So what is your opinion? Now, 
Now, yes, uh, about the so, uh, calcium replacement, uh, it can be used as a temporary measure to increase the heart rate and blood pressure. Now, you need to give uh, calcium gluconate, uh, gluconate over uh, five minutes slowly, 10%, 30 to 60 ml. You, we might not have calcium chlor uh, chloride, but still, if you are giving it, it has to be in a central venous axis and repeat boluses every 10 to 20 minutes and can, you can give it up to about three times. Then if the calcium level is uh, less than two millicolons per liter, you need to consider giving a calcium infusion. And you asked me about the sodium bicarbonate and if there's uh, severe metabolic acidosis, you can uh, give it. Our patient's uh, pH was less than 7.1 and 50 to 100 uh, millicolons sodium bicarbonate uh, can be given. And the atropine, of course, you can uh, uh, give a 0.6 milligram every two minutes up to about 1.8 milligram, but oh, it's often ineff ineffective uh, and uh, can consider uh, cardiac pacing, uh, but uh, again, it might not uh, improve the overall perfusion of this patient. So patient was intubated and sent to the ICU. Patient blood pressure dropped. And what are the vasopressors you can be used in the initial state here? Yeah, I mean, uh, this patient has uh, taken varapamil, it uh, reduces contractility and also reduces the, it also causes peripheral vas vasodilatation. So you need to combine uh, uh, all the catechol elements that you have, adrenaline, noradine, sometimes even dopamine. Um, so that's the usual combination which will, to get a uh, good contractility and to initiate a vasoconstriction. Hopefully that will improve the blood pressure. Uh, uh, and then if your, if your cardiac contractility is good, then you have to think of uh, peripheral vasodilatation as the main cause of uh, hypotension and you uh, go high up on the noradrenaline dose. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Now, in spite of these three inotropes and heart, blood pressure still remain low. So how do you explain this refractory hypertension? Well, <laughs> so this, this is, you have you've come to a point where you need help. You need help. You might have to talk to someone who knows about it. And that person will also not know much. Uh, or, and this is when you really go online and you know, look for case reports and, um, and see who has got, you know, go, gone there and done something better than you. So uh, you don't get evidence from randomized controlled clinical trials in toxicology. It's based on case reports and expert opinion, case series. So, so at this point, you would, you, I would look at uh, the IVC and then see whether it needs more fluids and go up on fluids if necessary. And then, you know, go up on the, the vasopressors as required. And then, uh, and then you look at other experimental treatment. Amiron is another drug that can be, that's a phosphodiacetate inhibitor, which has a positive anotrophic effect, but it has vasodilatation, so you have to make sure that it is primarily a, a, a contracted it issue, so you can try uh, uh, Amiron. And then if it doesn't work, then you have to you use other measures that you would use in any case, any hypertensive, refracted hypertension like ECMO bypass, uh, and then of course aortic uh, uh, balloon counterpulsation. Uh, yeah, so that's, and then when you search online, you know, you might come across very crazy treatments like methylene blue, which is used in sepsis, and there have been, there were about 10, 10 or 12 case reports that used uh, methylene blue uh, with successful results. But I must, for the 10 successful cases, there must be about 50 people who did not respond. So you could try this. Um, that reduces uh, nitric oxide production, and therefore we might be able to induce a vasoconstriction. Then there's this new fashion called interlipid solution. Um, for highly lipophilic substances, when you give lip, uh, interlipid, it's, it absorbs all the, the, not all, it absorbs lipophilic, lipophilic substance and it'll enhance elimination. So you can try that and then, then of course you can go to the next slide. There are several experimental th therapies, mainly in animal models. Um, you can try one of these uh, treatments, but again, we don't have them, but this is just for, it's good to know knowledge. So for the investigations, urine output dropped and creatinine propping up with CPK more than 1,000. So 
there's evidence of acute kidney injury. How do you manage it? Yeah, now there's, uh, there are a lot of causes that patient can have AKI. The direct toxin effect itself and the patient was dehydrated, hypotension and uh, reduced kidney perfusion. And the patient has actually has co-ingested metformin, so metformin induced lactic acidosis. And uh, as we have discussed, there's evidence of myoglobinuria all pointing towards AKI. Now, the management of AKI Actually, there's no, it's not an option for a CCB toxicity itself. But since there are a lot of uh, comorbidities which have sort of uh, pointed towards an AKI, you can try the CRRT. Now the patient is unstable, uh, so you can try it. Um, yeah. How do you deal with, now patient has taken metformin also, so how do you deal with metformin toxicity in this patient? Now, if the patient has presented uh, uh, metformin with metformin-induced lactic acidosis, that's a place for hemodialysis. But uh, normal HD is ineffective because there can be redistribution. So if you are trying it, it has to be sustained low-efficiency dialysis, what is what you call SLED or CRRT, and make sure that you use a bicarbonate-containing dialysate when you are doing the dialysis. So patient was managed in the ICU with the hazard, other medical complications, but he was a lucky patient. After three weeks of hospital stay, he was discharged home. Now, Vindika, what do you think the key points in I mean, this uh, summary? Thanks. I mean, as you could see, resuscitation is key, and this patient should have been resuscitated several hours ago, not at 18 hours post-ingestion. Uh, and you must remember that uh, if a patient comes following poisoning with hypotension, low GCS, and hypoxia, you're dealing with a very sick patient. So you need to manage flu blood pressure with fluids and, and inotropes as early as possible. And we should have a very low threshold for intubation because they, they deteriorate very quickly. And you know it's better to have a controlled patient at the beginning rather than you know having to run around later on. Um, and as you can see, as Madhuanti mentioned, hypotension, bradycardia, and high sugar. Uh, points to a calcium channel blocker. It induces a massive insulin resistance, uh, and um, you know uh, these patients, if they're if they're sick, they need to be managed in HDU and ICU setup because they get bad very quickly. And insulin dextrose is a treatment of choice. And when we mention one unit per kg uh, insulin or two units per kg per insulin, you, you get goosebumps. Like how how can I give 100 units of insulin an hour? But you don't have to worry they really become hypoglycemic. Usually, uh, development of hypoglycemia is actually uh, the indicator of, of, uh, of getting better. So usually it takes about 72 hours for your sugar, sugars to go up. So you, you really, you don't have to give much sugar, much glucose even in the early phase. And sometimes you get, you know, you don't have to worry about all the cases of calcium channel blocker poisoning. Those who come, uh, Milder poisoning, you don't need to be, you know, managed in ICUs. Slow release, ordinary release calcium channel blockers, you, you know, they don't, re if they remain an, uh, asymptomatic for up to four hours, you can send them home. Uh, but for long-acting ones, you might have to monitor them for about 16 hours uh, because of the slow uh, absorption. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let me thank uh, Professor Indika Gavaramman and Dr. Madhuanti Hettiarche for sharing the ex expertise with us. Due to time constraints, we will not allow any questions, but you will ask during the tea time. And uh, there's a token of appreciation. Please accept this. We show our appreciation in usual way uh, to the, our expertise. And with this, we conclude the session. Thank you very much for our listening. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone.